All right, so welcome back to Sociology of Law. In this first week, we're focusing on the general relationship between law and society and why social factors matter to understanding the law. And we're going to continue with understanding the history and philosophy of law in the West and how this relates to the sociology of law. So in our last lecture, we discussed variation in law across societies. Different societies have different legal rules and procedures. And by different societies, we could mean the same society over different historical periods because you know, England or France or Germany or America nowadays is a very different society than any of those countries 300 or 400 years ago. So let's compare the pre-modern West the Europe and England in the Middle Ages and Renaissance to the modern West, Europe and England and their descendant countries like America and Canada today. If we look at pre-modern law in Europe, we see something called the inquisitorial system. The inquisitorial system was common throughout Western Europe during the medieval and Renaissance period, and it was different in many, many ways from the legal system of, say, the U.S. today. In the inquisitorial system, you had no distinction between judge and prosecutor and jury and who brought complaints to court. It was one official who was charged with everything. So it was a magistrate who initiated the complaint and filed the charge against somebody, a magistrate who prosecuted the case in court and presented evidence of guilt, and the same magistrate who judged the case. So one person presented the evidence, brought the complaint, and then made a judgment. That's a lot of power in the hands of a single official. In this system, the accused were guilty until proven innocent, which is the opposite of the system in modern America, or at least what the ideal of our system is. People had to prove they were innocent of the crime they were accused of, and they could have a lot of trouble doing this because they didn't always know what they were being accused of because accusations could be secret. There was no right for people to know what they were being accused of or who was accusing them. They might just be brought into a room and questioned, and they know they're being questioned because they're suspected of a crime, but they have no idea what the crime is. So very hard not to incriminate yourself in some way or other. And finally, there was a foolproof tool for finding people guilty, which was getting them to confess. During this time period, the confession was called the queen of proofs. It was considered the highest standard of proof if you could get the accused to confess to their crime. And of course, how did you get them to confess? You tortured them. And torture is very reliable at getting confessions. The problem being that uh, if you torture someone long enough or hard enough, they'll confess to anything whether they did it or not. We can contrast the inquisitorial system common on continental Europe with another system that was common in England and the British Isles. This is called the adversarial system, and it's the ancestor of modern British and American law, and it's different in some ways from the law of the continent. So in the adversarial system, judges and juries would weigh arguments from both sides. So rather than having a single official who brings the complaint to court and presents the evidence and judges the case, you have people file complaints on their own and bring their own evidence to court or maybe like hire an attorney to bring evidence to court. And then the judges and the juries serve as neutral parties whose job it is to weigh the evidence of both sides and render a judgment. So there's some separation between the person making the case and the person judging the case. So power is not as concentrated in a, a single party. In this system, the accused were innocent until proven guilty. The idea was it was better to let a guilty person go free than to accidentally punish an innocent person. So the burden of proof was on the court to prove that the person who was accused actually did something wrong. Accusations also were made publicly. People knew what they were being accused of and who was accusing them, and they knew what they were defending themselves against in court, so they could come up with an argument to defend themselves or come up with relevant evidence. And in England, there was less use of torture. Notice I said less. There was still some. The Middle Ages were a pretty rough time, but there was relatively less use of it. It was not as standard, and confessions weren't at the center of the system, which is one reason when witch killings were becoming very common during the Renaissance period. 
you didn't get as many of them in England because the way you get witch killings is you torture someone until they confess to witchcraft and they name someone else who also was allegedly involved in witchcraft and you torture that person and they confess and it snowballs from there. And if you have a system where there's less torture, that snowball doesn't get rolling quite so fast. Now, even in the adversarial system, which resembles our modern law, much more closely than the inquisitorial system does, there were some differences. Both systems during earlier times relied on brutal punishments, punishments that today would be considered cruel and unusual, various forms of torture, stretching people on racks, putting them on pointy surfaces with weights tied to their feet, putting spikes into their bodies and cutting them and slicing them and burning them at the stake, having them pulled apart by horses, Brutal, violent punishments, and frequent executions. At one point in late medieval England, the death penalty was prescribed for over 70 crimes. And in these days, the death penalty was harsher than it is now because they tortured you to death. If someone just cut off your head, that was considered leniency. You, you hoped you got a quick death, but you could get a slow death being you know, pulled apart and burned and, and tortured in various ways. So the European legal system and ideals about the law began to change during a period that is commonly called the Enlightenment in the 16 to 1700s. And modern historians will argue about, you know, to what extent this concept is a good one. Maybe it's lumping together a bunch of different trends that happened in different times at different places. But the way we usually talk about this, the way it's traditionally understood, is that the Enlightenment was this cultural shift. It's the shift that happened in Europe during this time period where people put a relatively greater emphasis on reason and rationality. This is the time period when modern science really begins to get up and running and get this accelerating scientific progress. There was a greater emphasis on social equality. The old class system with its strict distinction between nobles and commoners, aristocrats and peasants, that was beginning to break down and you were getting this more fluid society with more equal rights between the different classes and less distinctions between classes. And this is also an uh, emphasis on individual liberty, the freedom of a person to decide their own life and where they want to go and what they want to do for a living and what path they want to take. And if you are an American, these might sound like very familiar ideas because they were involved in the founding of our country. When you read things like in the Declaration of Independence and the line about all men being created equal and the theory that governments are there to enforce individuals' rights and protect them and people can rebel if their rights aren't being protected by the government. These are very much Enlightenment ideals. So one thinker during this era who, based on these ideals, campaigned for legal reforms was Caesar Beccaria. And in 1764, he wrote a book arguing for several reforms to the legal system in Europe. So these reforms included things like a separation between legislation and judging cases. So he said only legislators should make the law, not judges. And the idea here is that you don't want to give the judge the power to just make up rules on the fly. Like say the judge has it out for somebody and, you know, the person proves himself innocent of theft, then maybe the judge could just say, okay, well, I'm making up a new law. It's now illegal to wear a blue shirt. You're wearing a blue shirt today. You're guilty and you're going to go to jail. You don't want to have the judge to have that kind of power. You want there to be set rules and then the judge has to enforce those rules and apply them, but they can't make them up. Another proposed reform was that law be applied equally to all social classes. And you know, again, from a modern viewpoint, this might seem obvious that it should be this way, but this was a radical idea at the time. It was a reformist idea. In the olden days, people took it for granted that different classes had different rights and privileges. If you were an aristocrat, you had different legal rights. And this is an argument to get rid of that and apply the law equally to everybody, high-born, low-born, or whatever. A third reform was that law should be clear and understandable and written down. And this is coming out of an age when important books uh, like the Bible and important you know, legal documents in the language of administration was often in something very different from the common tongue spoken by the average person. You know, throughout the, the Middle Ages, the language of religion and administration was Latin. 
And normal people in France or Germany or England didn't speak Latin. They spoke French and German and English. And so the idea here is to have the law written down in the common tongue and be made clear and understandable because you want people to be able to know when they're obeying the law and when they're breaking the law. This is an enlightenment idea of rationality and reason. The idea is that people are basically reasonable most of the time, and if they know violating the law will lead to bad consequences and they know what the law is, they'll avoid violating it. But you need to make it clear enough that they can make that rational decision not to violate the law. Another reform was to adopt that adversarial practice of a person is innocent until proven guilty. If they've been accused of a crime, it's the burden of proof is on the court to prove them guilty before they give them any sort of punishment. So this is an idea from the adversarial system that as, as systems throughout the continent reformed, it spread and was adopted throughout the West. Similarly, the idea of accusations being public and not secret became adopted, and this is one of Beccaria's reforms. And Beccaria argued that punishment was only for deterrence, so it should be rationally and reasonably applied. We should let the punishment fit the crime and only make punishment severe enough to have a deterrent effect. So you don't really need torturous executions. You don't need people killed slowly over a period of hours and pulled apart by horses. You don't need the death penalty for petty theft. You just need a punishment severe enough that it'll make people think twice about the crime. So in Beccaria's view, most of these brutal punishments of the earlier historical periods were just overkill. They were for vengeance and entertainment and things that weren't rationally calculated for deterrence. If these reforms seem like common sense, if they seem obvious, that's because they've been incorporated into modern Western jurisprudence. They are the foundation of law in England and America and other modern countries. Sometimes this modern jurisprudence is called liberal jurisprudence. Now, don't think of this in terms of modern political parties and the distinction between liberals and conservatives in our own society. Liberal here is something that would have been liberal compared to you know, the Middle Ages or the Renaissance. By this definition of liberal, everybody in modern society is liberal, whatever their opinions on modern politics. This is just the foundation of, of modern Western law. Liberal jurisprudence is the philosophy of law. It's, it's what law should be and how it should work and what does it even mean to have law. It's the dominant philosophy of law in the modern West. It's the ideological basis of our court systems. And here are three major principles of liberal jurisprudence. One is universalism. This is the idea that law should be applied equally to all people. Regardless of birth, regardless of class, regardless of where they come from, if you live under the rule of this legal system, the law should apply to you the same as it does to the next person. Second principle is formalism. This is the idea that cases should be determined by rules. It's not determined by the whims of the ruler. It's not determined by the attitudes or opinions of the judge or whether he has a personal grudge against the defendant. If you know what the rules are and if you know what someone's done and what evidence there is that they've done it, you should be able to accurately predict the outcome of the case. Law should be predictable and a reasonable person should be able to A, anticipate legal outcomes and B, know when they're violating the law or when they're not violating the law. The third principle is due process. And this is the idea that we have certain procedural protections from false accusations. You cannot punish somebody, you cannot hold them to be guilty of a crime unless you go through a certain process designed to weed out false accusations from accurate accusations. So rules against unreasonable search and seizure, rules that the court has to prove its case beyond a burden of a reasonable doubt, rules that you can't extract confessions uh, from torture or under duress, or you can't admit confessions as evidence if they've been extracted under torture or under duress. These are all examples of due process. Again, this might sound familiar because this is something that's so part of modern society that if you, if you grew up in one of these societies, you just absorb it naturally. But keep in mind, this is something very different from what came before historically, and it's one society's way of looking at the law. Also keep in mind that jurisprudence is how law should operate. It's often called legal theory, but it's not theory in the scientific sense of describing how things work. It's more philosophy or ethics saying how things should work. Science, on the other hand, describes how things do work. So science describes how law does operate. And so 
we can ask the question, how closely does modern law match jurisprudence? And that is a topic we'll take up in our next couple of lectures. <laughs>